All right, well, my name is Andrew Fengler, and I am here to talk to you about monitoring FreeBSD systems. Uh, so, let's go back to that page. So, and we know there. Sorry, I forgot the um, So, we have servers. We have servers to do things. If they're not doing things, they're giant wastes of metal that suck energy and create heat. Um, when we have servers performing activities for us, we want to make sure that they are continuing to do those activities as we set them up. Otherwise, they're not making us money. Um, it's good to keep these kind of things in mind. Uh, so we want to know why we're monitoring what we're monitoring. Um, so in this talk, we're gonna go over uh, some of the reasons behind monitoring, uh, general things you can monitor on a Unix system, um, how we get that information, how we make that information useful to us, uh, some pitfalls we want to avoid, and then of course since we're working with FreeBSD, FreeBSD itself has many particularities to deal with. Uh, so about me, I'm a system administrator at Scale Engine. Scale Engine is a content distribution network. We specialize in video streaming. Uh, we have a fleet of over 100 servers distributed through uh, I think it's 30-something data centers in 11 countries. So lots of global reach, but that means everything we want to do has to pass over lots and lots of cabling and often an ocean or two. And the internet is not as reliable as you might hope it is. Uh, so worldwide distribution presents many challenges for the distribution part, but it also prevents, presents many challenges for monitoring what we're doing. So, why do we monitor computer systems? Uh, as I've already mentioned, we ha we, the only reason we run computers at all is because we ha they provide a service that we want. If they are not continuing to provide that service, they're a waste of space. So we wanna make sure that we have our services, I mean, whether that's Nginx for people doing web stuff, if, if you run email servers, you might care that Postfix continues to run. If you don't run email servers and your Postfix goes down and no one can send you bugs, Maybe that's not something you need to wake up in the middle of the night over. But if you are an email provider, you probably want to know when your email servers are not working. Um, and as services, obviously the programs run on a computer, they need resources from that computer. So if we start running out of CPU, things are not going to work. Um, the importance of understanding what your services depends on is the key thing here. Uh, Postfix, for example, or sorry, uh, Nginx, for example, it relies heavily on internet connectivity. If uh, running a web server and not having internet connectivity isn't gonna work very well, but if your CPU is degraded, uh, if you're just serving static files and you're suddenly eating half your CPU on other things, Nginx will probably continue to work because it doesn't take much, much energy to pick up a file, throw it onto a network device, and call it a day. Uh, and that's the other category of things. Many things on a computer system are not worth your time to read an email about. If your CPU temperature went from 40 degrees to 50 degrees, do you care? Not really, but if it then continues to go up to 60 degrees, uh, you might want to call your data center provider about their air conditioning systems. Um, so of the resources, there's four, there's four main areas we concern ourselves about. You got your CPU, your memory, your network, and your disks. Those are the general, those are pretty much the four primary resources you have to worry about on a computer. Uh, so CPU is the most important. You need, your processor has to do some cycles to perform the magic required to make a program work. If you are putting too much work on the CPU, it runs out of cycles and everything goes slow. Uh, there's several ways to get your information from your CPU. Um, the easiest and most practical one for most cases is SNMP, Simple Network Monitoring Protocol, Simple Network Management Protocol, my apologies. Um, it has been around for a very long time. It is very ugly. Many people do not like it because it's ugly, but it works very, very well. Uh, these are MIBs specified by RFCs, so these will work in theory anywhere that follows the RFCs. So it makes it a very universal solution. It will also work on things that aren't generally thought of as computers, like switches and routers. 
that don't give you this information normally. So you, the UCD MIBs are the most useful here because they have your CPU and a whole bunch of other bits of information you care about. And you can get it in two ways. There's the old school way, which is to check the SS CPU idle counter, or number. I have no idea what SS stands for. Uh, but this shows you a percentage of how much CPU is idle. You can uh, see there, you get integer 83, 83% idle. Simple to understand, simple to work with, and it's the easiest method. But it lacks a lot of granularity, and it, it tends to make some assumptions in order to get these numbers. Like, that percentage has to be of an average. Average has to be calculated over a time period. What kind of a time period are we dealing with? Well, it was decreed one minute. So if you care to check less frequently, there's gaps in your data. If you check more frequently, your granularity is actually lower than, you, than you're trying to get. Uh, the other method you can use, um, this is a common technique when you're using SNMP, is a lot of data is expressed as counters. Uh, counter continuously increments. If we've used 10 more seconds of CPU time, the number goes up by 10. So we take a number now, and then we take a number again in five minutes, subtract one from the other, and we have a different, a delta. And then that delta isn't as sensitive to monitoring period. So if we check every five minutes, if we check every minute, if we check every five seconds, we can still get meaningful granularity at any level we want. It does take some more work to do, though. Uh, and as I said, there's a difference between the counter and the snapshot. With the rolling counter, with the rolling counter, you can get higher granularity. But if you're checking slowly, if you're checking infrequently, your granularity is lower. Uh, the percentages, because they're calculated server side as a snapshot of the time, uh, you can get a one minute snapshot. You can get your average at one, you can get your number at one minute granularity, even if you're not checking every minute. So that's a useful feature that you may be able to benefit from. Um, and I'll give you a look at what that sort of looks like. So the top one here, uh, this is a really bad comparison graph because the scales are completely different and one is stacked and one is not. So bear with me. But you can see here a few of the things I was talking about. You can see a little trough there and a little trough there. So the number, you can see the numbers are corresponding. Uh, but this one is more jagged. That's the one minute granularity at work because any small spike shows up bigger here, whereas this smooths it out. That can be either a benefit or a hindrance depending on what you're looking for. If you really need to know about every little spike, smoothing it out over five minutes is going to hide things that you might care about. On the other hand, if your processor winds up for a brief second, you probably might not care about it, depending on your workload, and you don't want to be receiving emails saying, CPU went up to 80%, panic, for when it only went up for a second. Now, there's another thing you might notice on this graph, specifically, that you see you have the user time, the system time, the nice time, the kernel time, interrupt, idle. You have every little thing that the CPU can be doing. Um, there's another method that people like to use to monitor how much work their CPU is doing. Uh, load average. Load average is much easier to work with. It's just a single number. It's so easy. Of course, unfortunately, the other problem there is you get numbers like, uh, our 15 minute average was 9.57. So we had 9.57 loads in the last five, 15 minutes. What does that mean? What does that mean if that is running on, say, a four core machine, a 16 core machine, a dual Naples 64 core machine? It means completely different things in all three of those cases. Uh, the other problem with using load average is it's sensitive to wait times. If you, have CP if you have processes waiting, your load average goes up. This might seem to make sense at first, and I guess it made sense to the people who came up with load average, that if your processes are waiting, something must be wrong. Uh, so I have a situation where we have servers running Nagios. Nagios runs a lot of little scripts. Each one of these little scripts forks off, throws something out the network, and then waits, and waits, and waits, and waits, and waits, and it gets some data back, does something with it, and it's done. So at any given time, that machine has a load average of 16 to 20, and it only has four cores. But it's doing perfectly fine, whereas other machines if they have an average of five on a four core machine, they're falling over. 
So these numbers have absolutely no bearing on reality. And the other problem, as I mentioned, you can see that you can see how much is idle, how much is, uh, how much is spent on interrupts and whatever else. With load average, you just see the load. So there's no good way to figure what it's out of. It's 9.57 out of, at least with the other numbers, you can look at the idle and compare. As you can see, we have more idle than usage, so that's, that processor is probably mostly idle. <coughs> mm -hmm. And next one is memory. Um, memory is useful to have. Uh, it's useful to have it free so that your processes can make use of it. If it's all used up by Firefox, uh, things start breaking. Uh, memory you can also get out of SNMP, although this is a case where you will have some problems. Because ARC, um, on FreeBSD, you're pro if you're running FreeBSD on servers, there's a good chance you're running it with ZFS. If you're running it with ZFS, you probably are using ARC, because ARC makes your disks go faster. Uh, if you're using ARC, it just shows up as wired memory. And this is uh, from my personal file server, because you can see I'm using 10 megabytes of active memory, and I have 55 megabytes free, and the rest is all just mashed into wired memory. And what if, what if that is ARC, and what if that is actually programs using the memory that can't get freed? Uh, you have to go through, dig through sysctls, uh, kstat, zfs, misc, arcstats, contains the information on what your arc is using. Uh, this allows you to see how much of this is arc and how much of this is actually memory, because as you ask for more memory, the arc will give you back memory. Um, so that's not really used memory. It will free up it when you need it. So if you're checking your memory free and you see 55 megabytes free, you're pretty much always going to see a number like that, because as you free up memory, the arc will take more. As you need more memory, the arc will give some back, so it becomes completely opaque how much memory you have available at all times. Um, so you can just use sysctl to get your arc stats, and then vm stats to get the memory statistics, and then subtract arc usage from uh, your memory, your wired memory usage, and that way you can get the better division of what's being used for what. Uh, there's a nice little pitfall here because uh, memory stats are measured in pages. Uh, arc stats are measured in bytes. Uh, you see, if you don't divide by page si or multiply by page size, you're going to get completely inconsistent numbers. Yes. Um, so up the, the, the top top of there, you you mentioned 55 free and what is that? 2780 wired. Yeah, 2786 wired. So on the next line, it has the arc broken out. So can you just subtract the Sorry. total and? These numbers are from top. If you want to manually parse top, that's your business. I want nothing to do with that. Uh, SNMP does not have any information on ARC. Sorry, I should have, I should have clarified that at first. Top is just reading the sysctls, so reading them directly is... You're, you're re-implementing top, which is, in this case, a good thing. No, no, that's fine. I was thinking in terms of top, not in terms of SNMP, that's why. And also, likely what you want to do is look at the so I don't I don't have the breakdown on this page unfortunately but if you go into just run sysctl and get all your arc stats and it breaks it down into how much is being used for MFU how much is being used for MRU how much is evictable how much is not how much is metadata? There's a whole wealth of information in there if you really care what is your ARC is doing. Um, personally, I don't. As long as it's ARCing, it's good. Um, I, I mostly just care that the memory is free and that there is freeable memory is the main point of concern here. If we don't have free, free or freeable memory, programs are going to start crashing very fast. Um, and the other one you can see is your memory throttle count. I did break this one out because the memory throttle count shows you a counter of since system start time, how many times uh, ZFS has returned memory from the arc. This is useful for seeing how much pressure there is, how much contention there is between what can the arc take and what the rest of the system needs. And if you see this number climbing, 
sorry, I'll try to keep my face away from the mic so I don't do that. Um, if you see this number start to climb, there's a lot of memory pressure. And if it's climbing a lot in a certain period, that might be something you might be interested in. Uh, network, network is one of the easiest things to monitor at first. Um, SNMP, almost any tool that plays with SNMP will know how to talk to the network. Uh, there's the if table, and it will give you the, sorry, the if mib, and it tells you all kinds of nice things about your network cards, like how many octets it sends since the system has started. And that's, again, as I've already mentioned with counters, counters are easy to calculate. It takes a little bit of work, but once you have that work done, it gives you a precise number, it's stable. If you miss a check period, you're not going to lose data uh, by doing continuous deltas. Uh, one warning is most programs by default will use if in octets and if out octets. If in octets and if out octets are 32-bit counters, you have to generally specifically tell them to use the 64-bit counters. That's if HC in and out octets. Um, if you don't use 64-bit counters, this counter is, a, is octets since, since, since the system started. Um, a 32-bit counter rolls over at 4 billion. 4 billion octets is 4 gigabytes, which with modern network speeds is not that much. Um, and if your counters are rolling over without you notice, without you observing them rolling over, uh, you get giant holes in your data and nonsensical patterns of usage. Uh, but as long as you use the 64-bit counters, they roll over at several exabytes, I think, uh, which is a very long time. So you can get a lot of very, you can get good information stably over a long period of time. Network quality is much harder to measure because the quality of your network is uh, one of the things that will really cripple you when you're trying to do overseas transit and lots of long distance. Um, sure, you might have a gigabit of connectivity to the next hop, but can you send it all the way across the Atlantic Ocean at a gigabit? Uh, there's not any good way to measure this. In our case, We've made a system for measuring this by having all our servers continuously ping each other and watch for changes in latency and packet loss. Uh, if we have a sudden change in latency, then a route has changed. Routes change all, all the time, but uh, if it changes and the latency doubles, uh, we might want to take a look at that server. If one server suddenly has a way higher latency to many servers, that there's a good chance that the provider's having some problems. Uh, sudden, sudden packet loss appearances uh, also matter there. Packet loss is something you want to be a little bit careful about measuring, uh, because if you see, say, 10% packet loss, uh, you, might want, you might immediately panic, because 10% packet loss is pretty bad. But uh, measurement error here can be quite intense uh, because when you, when you measure packet loss, you measure it generally with ICMP. So you send a bunch of ICMP probes. You'll generally send maybe say 10 or so. If just one of those probes goes missing, that's 10% packet loss. And one probe going missing is not an entirely uncommon appearance or occurrence. Uh, if you just send an email every time you lose one probe, your inbox is going to get flooded. Uh, so you want to, so generally, a small amount of packet loss suddenly showing up and going away, not a terribly huge problem. BGP takes five minutes to reconverge. If there, a problem merges, it's going to be five minutes before it's fixed. That's one of the limitations of the internet. Uh, it's if that packet loss is sustained over a much longer period of time, then you need to do something about it. Um, there are some other things you might want to look at on your interface. Sure, you can connect to the internet and you have good quality connections, but are you connecting at the right speed? Um, when you plug an ethernet cable into an e between two NICs, they do this thing called auto stateless auto configuration, which is where one NIC reports all the speeds it supports, and the other NIC picks the highest possible speeds and then says it only reports 10 megabits a second. And if you only negotiate 10 megabits a second, it is really surprisingly hard to diagnose this. Uh, why is my network capping out at 10 megabits? It's a gigabit interface. There's nothing going on. Because the only thing to tell you that it's only 10 megabits is if you go and run ifconfig and actually read the media line. Uh, there's, you're not going to get errors because 10 
if it's a perfectly valid configuration. Um, thankfully, as I've already said, the media line tells you the speed of the interface. Um, Linux does not do this, which is very painful because you have to go digging through eth tool, which is not something you would normally do. So it makes it a lot harder to find it there. But a uh, carefully crafted grep can get you the exact speed of the interface and report it out. And as long as it's the speed you want it to be, you're in business. There are many, there's another reason why your interface speed might not be what you think it should be, is because often when you rent servers, the provider will tell you, you can, the provider will give you a quota of how much bandwidth you can use, like 10 or 20 terabytes in a month. And if you go over that speed, they, that over, sorry, over that transfer level, they will stop you in one way or another. They will either charge you a lot of money, or they will charge, or they will cut your bandwidth speed down, sometimes to 100, sometimes to 10 megabits, or sometimes both. Um, and if suddenly your connection gets dropped down while you're under heavy usage, and you only see 100 megabits of load on one of your servers, you think that's a perfect candidate for putting more load on. A lot of your customers are going to have a very bad time. Um, this is also why bandwidth usage is on this list of things to watch for, because if you have quotas on your servers, it's a good idea to know how far through that quota they are. Um, and relying on your provider's statistics often are not very reliable. Uh, but you already have a counter of how many octets the server has sent. Um, so it's quite simple to just save those deltas somewhere. We use a program called RTG. RTG does the same thing as MRTG and pretty much any other program that uses, that does uh, bandwidth use, sorry, uh, SNMP monitoring of your interface, network interfaces. But it uses a MySQL database. This is one area where uh, just packing it all into MySQL is a good idea because most time series databases do data averaging to reduce, to reduce the amount of total data stored in them. Uh, our RRD databases are a very bad example of this. Uh, as, as data gets older, it continuously deletes data points to give you less granularity. Uh, losing data points means you're losing uh, precision, loss of precision added up over an entire month as your five minute data points get averaged down to 10 minutes to 15 minutes to one hour, you'll lose a lot of precision and this precision can add up to hundreds of gigabytes over a month. And if you're 100 gigabytes off of what you think your quote is, you can roll over without noticing. Um, so for some cases, RRDs are great because they don't grow in size and fill your entire disk. In some cases, they are not great, and you need to find a better solution. But uh, as you can see, I've been using RRDs for uh, all my graphs here. It's what we use for all our graphing, and it's quite nice for everything except for bandwidth usage. Uh, disks, disks is another resource you're gonna wanna monitor. Uh, if your disks are out of space, programs exit with funny errors. And uh, usage is the most obvious thing to monitor. You want to make sure you have some free disk space. If you have some free disk space, you're happy. So you run the SNMP, look at the disks table, look at root of your file system, you got 50 gigs free, you're good to go. Um, this is, again, where FreeBSD is going to throw you a curveball. ZFS is nice. ZFS lets you do things like set reservations. That way, a runaway log file in var log is not going to flood your root data set and make you run out of space. So you set a 50 gigabyte reservation on the root data set. Um, and now, uh, if var log has a runaway file, it fills up var log, but the root of the data set still has 50 gigabytes free. So when you check with SNMP, you see 50 gigabytes free. And you wonder why nothing can write to the disk in other places than the root. ZFS, because it has lots of new and advanced features, SNMP is old and is not aware of any of those features. <laughs> uh, there's two ways to check through SNMP. Uh, the, the easy one that a lot of things do automatically is to check what percentage of the disk is used. For reasons I'm not actually quite sure why it turns out this way, uh, SNMP will continuously report 0% used if you're using ZFS. Uh, you can get some usage out of it by checking how much disk is free. The problem is that free will continuously decrease as there's usage in other data sets, 
because it's not actually partitions with a fixed size, it's all shared free. So your disk will continuously appear to be changing in size, um, which can make some very confusing graphs. But as long as you check all your data sets have some free space left in them, you can know with pretty good confidence that you have some free space on your system. Uh, there, there are better ways to do this though. Uh, the easiest one is of course just ZFS. ZFS is very easy to work with and it's very easy to automate with. Uh, there's a couple flags I've got up there. I don't know if you can see them or not, but you can use P and H to make the numbers parsable rather than trying to print it out in megabytes or something. And H will remove all the headers and you can ask using O exactly what fields we care about. In this case, I've got name used and available, which is pretty much the minimum amount you want. And this gives you all your disk usage information all in one place. And it just takes a couple, a little for loop and a split to get that into something you can work with. Um, and you got disk space free, but you need to have your disks healthy. If a disk fails on you, you're Hopefully you're running RAID, so hopefully your data will survive. Um, but if you don't notice that a disk has failed, the next one will fail eventually. Um, there are other things that can happen when your disks fail. Just if a disk fails, it might just run really, really slow. And ZFS will just wait for that disk to do its thing so it can keep trying and trying and trying and your entire pool grinds down to the speed of the weakest link which is not fun. So knowing about your disks dying before they actually cough on you is something that's always great to know about. Uh, so this means smart. You're going to be working with smart. Uh, smart is your disk health monitoring. Uh, currently there is exactly one good program for this, that's smart CTL. Anyone who's worked with smart CTL knows how painful it is to try to get any useful information out of it. Now, one day soon, we should have a new program called LibSmart, which should give us much better information uh, in a much easier to access format. But for now, you're stuck taking LibSmart and manually parsing human readable text. It's not quite as hard as you might think though. Uh, thankfully, every single line in smart CTL has the number of the smart value at the start of the line, which makes it pretty easy to peel them out with regexes. And it may be a very intimidating output with dozens of values, but there's only about four you really need to care about. Uh, the first one is the overall health test, overall self assessment health test. If that says passed, most of the random little things that you never see move, like spin retry fails and gsense error, which detects if the drive has been dropped. As long as those are fine, the health test will pass. If the health test, if one of those starts going out of bounds, the health test will fail. So just watching the health test will save you from having to watch all these little values. The other one is your retired block count on an SSD or reallocated sectors on a hard drive. This is how many sectors have worn out and have needed to be replaced. Now this is a normal wear thing. Drives lose sectors, it's what they do. Uh, but when that number starts to climb over a pretty, and starts to hit the triple di mid to high triple digits, or it suddenly starts making a nice diagonal line on the graph, that's an indication that your drive is approaching the end of its life. Um, the ones that are a little more scary are the current pending sector and offline uncorrectable, which on every drive except for Toshiba, they report the same number. Um, when these start to climb up, that means the disk is having errors trying to write to certain sectors. This can either be kind of normal or very, very bad. Uh, so usually when this hits the triple digits, it's time to get rid of that drive before it gets rid of itself. Um, I can show you what I'm explaining here. Um, these are two drives on one of my servers. Um, this top line here, this is the reallocated sectors for one of the drives. Just see how it's slowly climbing up like that. Um, it's continued to climb up like that since I've taken that graph and is probably going to die sometime soon. Unfortunately, just because it's having errors doesn't actually have any concrete meaning here. It may die in the next week, it may die in the next month, it may die in the next year. I don't know. Uh, the lower line here is the um, offline uncorrectable, 
which is a bit lower, but still slowly climbing. Now there's another drive on the server. You can see here, it suddenly shoots up. It sits there for a bit and then vanishes because the drive just falls off the bus at that point. Uh, and so this is, this is two different failure modes you're looking at here. Of, of the two ways I've seen drives fail, these are basically both of them. It just slowly grows over time and eventually dies, or you get a little bit of warning and then it's gone. Or you just get no warning at all sometimes. Yes? Are you collecting latency data? Mm, not on this, not with Smart. Um, Somewhere. Uh, not actually at all right now. <laughs> Smart doesn't give you, uh, doesn't tell you anything about uh, performance or latency. It doesn't. Oh, correct, and that's what I'm asking. ZFS can give you IO stats on a pool that doesn't give you per disk granularity to my awareness. Um, and you can also do manual checks of uh, band of sorry I/O load on a disk. Uh, you can manually work out some form of an I/O check. There's many ways to check how the disk itself performs. Uh, this is mostly just uh, what it thinks its health is, but it's fairly accurate. Uh, the other one you can notice that's in here is the temperature. Um, temperature of drives does matter. Uh, there was a study by uh, Google and I think Intel had a separate one. I don't know entirely, but if drives, drives have two ratings on them. The first one is the maximum operating temperature. In some cases, in some um, HGST drives, it, this can be as high as 70 degrees Celsius. Uh, but that's not the optimum operating temperature. The optimum operating temperature is generally 30 degrees. If you go over that, your the expected drive lifespan is going to start falling. Uh, uh, I believe Google found that it was every 10 degrees increase was having the lifespan. Uh, this was a long time ago, so I don't know how that correlates to today's drives. Um, I don't have a lot of drives that are running hot, and I don't tend to take a whole bunch of drives and cook them. But yes. So on the flip side of that, uh, some drives, uh, if they get cold enough. Uh, they, don't, they don't necessarily start, uh, it doesn't necessarily impact their life, but it can drastically impact performance. Um, if it gets cold enough, they will start basically, um, after every write, it will wait for the platter to spin around and verify that write, uh, which means that your write bandwidth falls way through the floor, through the basement, and lands up somewhere around the center of the year. <laughs> How cold is that? Uh, depends on the drive. Uh, the last time I was really aware of it, it kicked in at around 60 Celsius, uh, 60 Fahrenheit. Um, so, uh, what's that? Maybe 15, 16 Celsius? I think 15 Celsius is the number I've heard before for drives not liking the cold. Yeah. So, uh, this does get into a very convoluted topic of the effect of temperature on air density and the Bernoulli effect, and uh, that's we can talk about for that for hours after my talk if you want. Um, but in any case, your drive will have a rated optimum temperature, and it's usually, if it you can't figure it out, it's probably 15 to 30 degrees, and if it goes outside that range, uh, they're probably not going to live as long as they could otherwise. Uh, that said, if it's 25 degrees, you don't you really need to panic and crank up your air conditioner. It'll probably live just as long at 25 degrees as it will at 20 degrees. Backblaze did a thing uh, just a couple of weeks ago, actually, uh, where they tried to replicate the drive temperatures, and they have the guy comparing 25 degree drives to 27 degree drives and saying there's no correlation between temperature and drive life. Thanks, Backblaze. <laughs> um, but if we go back here, uh, Zpool health is another thing you're really going to want to check. Just because your drives are healthy doesn't mean that ZFS thinks they're there at all. You can have cable failures, you can have uh, just too many errors and ZFS gave up on it, even though it's perfectly fine and it's a temporary condition. Um, all kinds of reasons why, or a drive could have temporarily gone away, came back, doesn't automatically get remounted, now your pool is running minus one drive. Uh, this can lead to all kinds of bad things when a drive fails and it turns out one of your other drives wasn't even connected at all, <laughs> as I learned the hard way. Um, again, very easy. Zpool list has all the same uh, flags and features that uh, ZFS list does, so it's very easy to get something parsable out of it here. I'm just using the default output to show you all the information is there. 
you can dig into all kinds of other things like the fragmentation and capacity and deduplication and compression and whatever else you want to dig out as statistics. Uh, the key feature is right there, just health online. If it says online, you're good. If it doesn't say online, uh, time to start playing with drives. Uh, you can do one better than this if you parse the output of zpool status, which unfortunately does not have a machine readable format. I'm staring at any ZFS developers in the room. Um, but it does not have a machine readable output. It's not terribly hard to parse. But if you dig your way through that with some clever regexes, you can figure out exactly which drive failed, exactly what happened to it, and uh, also not panic because the array is rebuilding. It's a little annoying when you continue to get emails after you've replaced the drive because it's rebuilding the array, so it's not actually online. Uh, but yes, make sure your pools have all the drives you think they do. And then there's other things we want to check. Uh, just because all your resources are there and available and so on, there's a lot of other things that can bring your server to its knees. Um, uptime. If we don't have monitoring of our uptime, how are we going to brag about it on the internet? Um, but uptime is also a really good way of catching when your server reboots. Uh, if you just get a bit of packet loss, did the server go down, did it come back? Was it just temporarily network problems? Uh, if you check your uptime, um, you know for sure. Uh, uptime is actually an SNMP, conveniently enough, and it will tell you a counter of how long the system has been up. And if this uptime is less than uh, double your monitoring interval, that means there's been a reboot. Uh, and this is also very conveniently, as I mentioned, SNMP works on switches. Switches can reboot really, really, really fast, and there's no other way to figure out how long they've been up. So if you have a switch that's rebooting really fast, it might just appear as a little bit of uh, uh, packet loss. And then you're trying, running around with your head torn off trying to find all this mystery packet loss, and it turns out your switch is just overheating and rebooting, or its power supply is flaking out. So if you watch your uptime, you can tell exactly when your servers have rebooted. Um, NTP, uh, a little drift is not a big deal. If it keeps drifting, then your SSL sessions start failing. And that is not fun to diagnose, uh, that your clock is out of skew and that's why nothing is working. Um, you, should be syncing your, uh, you should be syncing your clocks with NTP, otherwise something's gonna break eventually if you don't. And then another key takeaway here is when you check NTP to make sure you're synchronized, don't check against the same server you're synchronizing against because if that server goes for a, it goes and has a fit, then you're going to think everything is fine because I'm still synchronized to the server that now thinks it's 1970. Um, temperature, um, this, is, this has less of a long-term effect than your drive temperature. If your CPU is warm, it really doesn't care as long as it's not on fire. Um, and as I said before, if your temperature is 40 degrees, if it's 50 degrees, you probably don't actually care what the number is. The number is probably purely academic. But um, when throttling kicks in, the only thing to show you that it's throttling is the fact that your CPU checks are all alerting and one line in uh, syslog to tell you that it kicked in the thermal throttling. Uh, you got a couple options here. If you just check your temperature, it's a pretty dead giveaway. If your temperature, if your CPU is running at 80 or 90 degrees, it's pretty obvious that you're, it's, it's throttling to protect itself. Uh, otherwise, you're going to be parsing through the CPU frequencies before you figure out what's going on. If you have GPUs, you may care what they are doing. If you're using GPUs for some kind of compute workload, uh, generally just saying, well, they're continuing to compute is not a good understanding of the situation. NVIDIA does a very wonderful job of this. Uh, you can complain about their driver all you want, and I certainly will, uh, but the NVIDIA SMI tool that they ship with it does a brilliant job of giving you uh, a, a understanding of what the GPU is doing. It also does the another brilliant thing of, if you use the X flag, it prints out in XML. Uh, and then this way you don't have to use random handcrafted regexes to try to strip out what was supposed to be human readable text. And in our case, um, the usage we care about is the encoder and decoder utilization because we use our GPUs for video transcoding. So we care that the, we care that the encoder and decoder ASICs have some free capacity. Um, if these things, hit, these things can hit 100% and the GPU util is still pretty low. So you have to 
uh, you have to be careful that you're checking the correct thing because there's a ton the, the output's been redacted uh, down to what I care about because there is a ton of information in there. It scrolls for about three pages. So whatever you care about, it's you can probably monitor it through that. Now that's for NVIDIA. Uh, Intel and AMD leave you completely in the dark. It'd be brilliant if there was a, an Intel a developer who worked for Intel who had experience with um, graphics drivers who maybe wanted to give something nice to the community. Uh, I was looking for some ideas. I don't know if such a person exists. Uh, but uh, if we could get a tool like this for Intel's uh, QuickSync or just the GPU workload in general, that would be very nice to have. And ditto for AMD, although we don't use that. But I imagine someone out there does. Uh, there's a lot of other things you need to be aware of. Um, this is kind of getting into the pitfalls part of the talk. Uh, jails. Jails are fun to work with. Jails are easy to jails do great things. Uh, compartmentalization is brilliant. Um, unfortunately, because the jail shares a kernel with the host system, things like CPU utilization and how much memory is it using, uh, there's really no dividing. You can't just. It's very hard to get how much CPU is this jail using. Uh, so when you have services running on jails and certain the host, you have to keep a tight, our solution to this has always been a tight coupling. We know what jail is on what host. So if a host starts running out of CPU, we know that that jail is going to suddenly start having problems. If a jail suddenly starts having problems, go check what the host is doing to make sure it's not having problems. Now there's some light on the end of the tunnel. Uh, in FreeBSD 12, jails now are using VNet by default. VNet means there's a virtual network device, so you can at least get isolated network statistics for your jails now. So progress has been made, slowly. Um, there's a good habit of, I find, of people write a tool to suit their needs and they write a tool for exactly the needs they have right now and nothing else. Um, there's nothing more certain to change than something you hard-coded into your script as a static number. Uh, if you decided that 60 degrees uh, Celsius ought to be enough for any CPU, uh, your, your one of your providers is going to decide that they want to save money on their air conditioning. Um, because I currently right now have decided to hard code that 60 degrees was the perfect warning temperature for my CPUs and now one of them run, idles at, it runs at 63 under load and it keeps clogging up my, da my monitoring dashboard and I need to fix that. Generally, you want to make sure that anything that's subject to change, like a, say a warning threshold or um, uh, which disks you want to be looking for, can be provided as arguments to your scripts. Um, that way you can feed them in from your server orchestration system or just in, set, set them in the cron tab or whatever else your system of running these scripts is because that way it can be changed easily. If you, for a while we had a little fun problem where because our system was set to automatically find every disk on the system, it would also find the device called CD0 and spit errors <laughs> because you can't get smart data from a CD. Uh, and portability. Uh, how many people here run FreeBSD on a server? How many people only run FreeBSD on a server and no other operating system at all? We got like five. <laughs> um, it's it's sort of reality that uh, you're going for most of us. You're going to have to have other operating systems going on. Uh, whether it's, for my use case, it's Linux because we have some proprietary software that only has ships libraries for Linux for certain things. Um, maybe you need some other operating system for some other reason, but portability is hard to work with. Even between versions of FreeBSD, you'll sometimes run into very little things that bite you, and it's, it's always the small things. It's not hard to forget. It, it's easy to remember that um, it's easy to remember that some tool that's FreeBSD specific is not going to work on Linux or GNU extensions to something are not going to work on FreeBSD but, it's, but there's always going to be something little that trips you up. The one that got me for a really long time was Cut. 
cut is the kind of thing you would expect to be completely portable. It's been around since, what, the 80s? Um, of course, some FreeBSD developer, don't know who, but someone came up with a really fun and handy extension. It is very handy. If you put dash W in cut, uh, it will use any amount of white space as a delimiter. Uh, rather than trying to guess how many tabs are going to be in it, which is amazing for parsing through anything that's been pretty printed. Uh, unfortunately, that doesn't work on Linux, so that when you take your check and go and run it on Linux, it breaks. And then it spits the error message into grep, and then grep matches nothing, and then it spits out zero. And you don't notice it until you have problems and wonder why the check didn't work. Um, which is another problem uh, you'll run into there is error handling. So if you do something, create an error, and you have it in the middle of a pipeline, that error just gets sent into the pipeline or just spit out to the console where no one's watching and no one cares, <laughs> and then you'll never know that there's been a problem until afterwards. Um, the list of things that can give you these problems is pretty much endless. I gave up after finding like 20 of them. Uh, the, big one, the big ones to watch for is the network. Anything with the network is incompatible. Anything with disks is incompatible. Um, anything with ZFS is incompatible. Anything where FreeBSD added ZFS specific flags is incompatible, even if you're running ZFS on Linux. Um, so you have to watch out a lot with the shell utilities. And then of course graphs. Um, there's a lot of popularity for using Graphena and Graphite and every other utility under the sun with Graph in its name. Um, and you can see that I've always, I've just been using RD tool for my graphs because RD tool spits out a line graph that's, it's a solved problem. Um, whereas you can draw all these, oops, that's too far. You can draw all these extremely pretty graphs, but the way graphs look better is because they're more readable than a table full of data. A table full of data is not readable, a line graph is readable. And you can make it more readable by reducing the amount of information further. And if you keep reducing the amount of information until you just have abstract bubbles on the screen, uh, you can look at it and it looks very pretty, but it's not going to show you anything that tells you why there's a problem. This is a very uh, app use case specific thing where you have to be careful not to pretty things down too much. At a certain point, you need hard numbers. If you draw this into some graph shape thing, uh, you don't get the precision anymore. If you don't have the precision, you might not be getting the kind of information you need out of it. And we are com we're all computer people. We know how to use computers. So are our coworkers. And um, so if your inbox is getting flooded with emails, you will make them stop somehow. And so will your coworkers. So if you're alerting on every problem because every problem is level one, is level one importance, you're going to read none of them. Uh, rules like this will show up uh, if you send your coworkers too much email. Or they just will filter it all into a folder and just never read it. Or just select all emails from your monitoring server and delete them all every morning. Um, you have to be, again, as I said with the graphs, it's a balancing act between keeping it pretty and giving you a lot of information. It's a balancing act between um, giving you the information when an error appears and not flooding your inbox to the point where you no longer read your emails. If you send an email on every error, you're going to ignore them all. If you are too insensitive to errors, you're not going to notice when there's a problem. Again, this has to be balanced for every situation. Current, for us, we get a lot of errors because uh, transiting across the entire planet, um, a lot of stuff breaks, surprisingly. The internet is held together with duct tape and hope. Um, so we do get a lot of errors from network connectivity. And uh, there's no good answer to that because do we want to not notice when there's connectivity problems? We kind of do, which means we kind of need to receive all those emails about those problems. So this is not a question I have an answer to. If someone has an answer to this question, I would love to hear it. But that is all for my talk. Does anyone have any questions? Yes? Have you looked at smoke ping? Could you like to see if I have lost a lot of errors? Sorry, what was that? Have you looked at a tool called smoke ping? So the question was if I've looked at a tool called smoke ping for latency graphs. I have not even heard of that. That sounds interesting. It's written by uh, the RD tool guy. Oh. 
very interesting. I'll take a look at that. Um, currently, I think I mentioned it a bit earlier, but we we just have a system where we have every server ping every other server. Yeah, I've set up smoking to do the same, and you get the of it. It's called smoking for a reason. You'll see when you look at the grass. Okay, thank you. I'll take a look at that. I'd actually like to second that and actually look at another alternative to that called vaping. <laughs> I've actually heard that name, but I've never realized what it was. Presentation on vaping, which does exactly that. But it can do MTRs, it can do a number of things to report that data. Uh, it can also export it into many pretty things like Grafana and whatnot. So that's actually a very useful thing you just brought up that I've been looking for a way to do for a really long time. Is when there's a network problem take an MTR in both directions and save it somewhere. That way when I report it to the problem, and when I report it to the problem to my provider, and their automatic response is, please provide bi-directional MTRs showing the problem. Of course, if the problem happens at three in the morning, I'm not awake at three in the morning to catch the problem. Yeah, so having something- be that asshole <laughs> <laughs> Now I know who's behind all that. Anyone else got a question? Yes. Yeah, just wanted to point something out regarding um, the, the thing that you had on CPU temperatures. Um, one of the things I found um, in the past when I used to be a sysadmin, which is very useful, is also to record um, the puts uh, fan speeds as well. Um, this is get um, issues with fan failures and odd fan vibration issues. Like when the um, CPU temperature goes up, the fan speed goes up, and then suddenly the fan speed drops. That is an indication that you have a possible fan failure on the cloud basis. And you can actually, that can actually also have knock on effects. Like if your chassis did not have good vibration or isolation on the fan, you suddenly find that the noise generated from that drop source causes your hard drive to plummet. So it's something which can be very useful. Yes, that's uh, another interesting point. Um, the, well, for one, the vibration caused by anything causing hard drive failures is a really neat topic, and there's a nice video of uh, Brian Cantrell yelling at hard drives. Um, uh, but, sorry? Brendan Gregg. Oh, sorry, Brendan Gregg. My, my apologies. Um, and yes, uh, monitoring your fan speed is another thing that would be great. Uh, I, know, I know LM sensors on CentOS can do it. Um, I'm, because all our servers use IPMI, I'm not sure how well that information passes through into FreeBSD. Um, I've been looking at ways to monitor IPMI. Unfortunately, it is all magic numbers passed down through tri ancient tribal knowledge. So, uh, so um I mean, the obvious ways to do it are number one, screen scrape by my tool. Uh, but if there a slightly less terrible way is IPMI tool is actually a front end for live IPMI tool. And uh, you can uh, write some C code which gets which lets live IPMI tool do all the hard work and get back a fairly understandable data structure, um, including uh, you know, temp direct, you know, Celsius temperatures or RPM fan speeds or whatever. Uh, yeah, that, that would be amazing if you had something that did that because the problem I've been encountering is that uh, the, ma the exact magic numbers change with every generation of Supermicro motherboard. I don't know if this is just a Supermicro problem or if this is a gener general IPMI problem, but uh, I have a directory full of lines of magic IPMI rock commands. Uh, so, for yeah. various things involving fans, temperatures, uh, so, power supplies. Yeah, Sorry. So, so, so that is that is a fair point. Um, one, so, so there's a whole bunch of stuff that uh, can be reported through IPMI. There are standard methods for IPMI for reporting these things, but for whatever reason, the vendor and has been every vendor uh, does not report them all. And in most cases, that information is actually available to the BMC. And if you do have the right magic number can go read the source that the BMC is getting all this data from, you can read it directly, and you can see all the data there that the BMC, for whatever reason, is not providing. So yeah, there is definitely a lot of magic numbers involved. Yeah. Which is uh, the same problem I have for uh, power supplies on chassis with uh, hot swappable power supplies where you have two of them right. and one of them goes and dies and there's no good way to detect if it's dead.
because it requires a different magic number for every single motherboard, apparently. At least with Supermicro. Again, I don't have much experience with non-Supermicro servers. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, Sorry. All right. Um, I was just wondering if you uh, looked at uh, EMPF Redfish at all. I know the newer Supermicro boards are starting to support that, and I, I, I haven't looked much at the monitoring aspects of that and whether that would provide any relief. So my, my understanding of Redfish, because I talked to them recently and they also said, uh, oh, use Redfish. Um, my understanding is that that gives you the same data in perhaps a more uh, parsable format, but I don't see anything there that suggests that they would actually provide more data than they already do. I think it's just a nicer interface on the same data that they were providing through IP Mine, uh, but I don't think that's necessarily more data. Well, BMC writers aren't going to, you know, go out of their way. They probably just refactored everything to park out the same strings, just with a different wrapper. But, uh, yeah, quite possibly. But the, I mean, I, they do intend to move that spec forward. So if we have feedback, we should probably push on them and uh, try to get better stuff. Because I know that uh, it was hard to get that started because no one would list, or what I was told was that no one would list Redfish as a requirement. And uh, all the vendors were waiting to support it because, you know, once it started showing up as a requirement. <laughs> so the question was about Redfish for getting IPMI details. Um, in our situation, I did look at Redfish. Uh, most of our, we've only just started to get motherboards that are new enough for it. Um, and also, again, I didn't see anything indicating that there was any more or less information involved. Um, the better parsability would be nice, but it, if it only supports like a quarter of our servers, it's not very useful. Um, and sorry, I think we have one more question over there. I'm not sure whether I missed it or not, but what were you using to monitor disk wait time? Um, for disk wait time, and uh, we don't actually have anything right now. Previously, we did have uh, an SNMP one, and I was at one point several years ago working on a tool to get disk latency, um, but I haven't touched that in several years. Unfortunately, it's been on that list of things to do for a very long time. Um, uh, you can get I.O. information out of ZFS and out of SNMP. Uh, that's my knowledge of the situation. Yes? Uh, I know in, in FreeNAS, you can, the r and &E tool graph, you show the, uh, the disk latency. I haven't been in the code that, that generates that, but that maybe something that... So there you have a place to look. I'd like to know how to get some of that information. Collecti as well. Um, I Collecti is another. I, I use Nogios, um, so I've never quite had a reason to use Collecti, but Collecti does look very nice if you're looking for somewhere to start. Uh, GStat's pretty good. So if there's a Geom layer of data, pull from there. Right. That's that's what I was using. I completely forgot that. Yes, GStat. If you want the information on what your disks are doing, GStat is the place to start. Is it possible to do an output with that for human? Well, you can make anything human readable, but. Well, you can use the stat big C flag now to get the CSV output. Okay, any other questions? I think that's everything. Thank you very much, guys.